Our reflections this morning will be offered first by Amanda Hazel and then by Cinda Cheney. Amanda? Here we go for round two. So when I thought, when I was first approached to do this, I thought about writing this from the perspective of Miss De Doctrine, but I figured we heard enough from her during the play that it probably wasn't a good idea to do that. <laughs> okay, so on to more serious, that was my kind of funny opening. When I was actually asked to speak on the topic, curiosity moving from fear to open-heartedness, I immediately said yes without really thinking. That's kind of how I roll, jump in feet first and then the reality of the project hits me and I say, oh Mandy, well you came and you gave without taking. It's either that or I'm going to take you by surprise and make you realize, Amanda. Or if that's not your cup of tea, we can go with this one. Amanda, light of my life, fate should have made you a gentleman's wife. OK, so you got Barry Whalen or Boston. Take your pick. I was apprehensive about writing this at first. I was afraid I would repeat ideas and connections that you've heard before. So I decided to have a conversation with Curiosity, who was looking through a file cabinet in my brain. You're curious about me, she asked, before I could really say anything. Oh, uh, well, yes, I managed to respond. Or, excuse me, managed to respond. I was spooky. She knew what I was going to ask before I even asked it. Closing the file drawer, she looks puzzled. Why? Well, I'm writing a short speech for church about curiosity and fear, and I was wondering why you and fear seem to be at odds with each other. She sits down in a large plush chair. I thought, I didn't know I had a large plush chair in my head. When did the chair show up? Do I get a chair? I need a chair. It appeared because I needed to sit. No, you can't sit in a chair because this is all in your mind. You're imagining this conversation, Curiosity tells me. Wait, you can read my thoughts? She lets out an exasperated sigh. Yes, because your thoughts are you and I'm a part of you. And she pauses before continuing. The relationship between myself and fear is complicated. We both want the best for you, but we have different ways of expressing ourselves. Fear wants you to stay in a bubble of familiar with no surprises. I, on the other hand, want you to have new experiences, people, places, things, food, ideas. The best way to grow and be a more well-rounded person is to be curious. But why does fear want me to stay in the same place, I asked. What's wrong with growing and having new experiences? Curiosity furrows her brow. Fear is afraid that new experiences will lead to dangerous situations where your life will be in peril. If you never try anything new, you'll never be in danger. But that sounds boring, I interrupt. I like new experiences. They're fun, they, they make for great memories. Yes, but there are times that you gave in to fear and listened to her over me. And it's not even about dangerous experiences. It's about experiences that, where you have a self-imposed boundary at the urging of fear. But that's impossible. Look at, look at all the milestones in my life. All the things that I've accomplished, I said. If fear's trying to rule me, how did I succeed? How am I not stuck in the same place? Curiosity smiled. Well, in the last few years, you learned not to take fear so seriously and to be more curious. Fear didn't like that, so she called upon anxiety. Those two are like peas in a pod. When fear began to accept that she couldn't influence you as she once did, and anxiety was finally controlled with medication, fear lost her assertiveness over you. As to the milestones in your life, 
I worked with other emotions to make those milestones come true. Love and I partnered when you and Daryl dated and married. Determination supported me when you were in college. You were so curious to learn about the law and being a paralegal. Determination helped you stay on the path to graduate. And by the way, I also had a hand in helping you become a UU. What? N no, how? I said. I was astonished. Why do you think the idea of Unitarian Universalism stayed with you since the age of 18? You were curious about it. But fear overruled your desire to learn more. When you made the decision that fear would no longer be a major influence, you began to live your life your way. I just had to wait for the right moment to give you a push to visit Westside. I smiled. I'm so glad you did. I have friends. I'm singing in the choir. And I'm learning so much. But what about fear? She still shows up from time to time. Yeah, and she will. You need a dose of fear every so often to keep the balance. But since you've, but now, You've learned how to keep her in check. Curiosity stands and stretches and walks back to the file cabinet. Now, if there's nothing else, I see that we're curious about, and she fades away. Thank you, Amanda. And now, Cinda Cheney. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So let's continue exploring the practice of moving from fear to an open heart. Now from the standpoint of human relations, each of us has encountered and reacted to situations which produced upsetting emotions that we didn't know how to deal with. Like bursts of temper, outpouring of grief, painful episodes of misunderstanding and criticism, which often lead to the forming and bearing of grudges. As children and adolescents, we aren't equipped with the cognitive or emotional maturity to deal with the stress and suffering of negative human emotions. So our subconscious takes over and develops strategies for our psychological survival, which are designed to get us through the harrowing landscape of vulnerability in those early years. All too often, though, this brings about avoidance of being subjective subjected to negative emotional states in ourselves as well as others. The subconscious produces a fight or flight kind of response, which usually leads to a shutting down or rejection of encounters which elicit anxiety, distress, and fear. And unfortunately for most of us, if we don't get some kind of counseling or retraining in adulthood which teaches us conflict transformation skills and how to work through the residual suffering which has been pushed down and stuffed away since childhood, then we end up being cut off from the depth and authenticity of what it means to be human. We become, to a certain extent, only shadows of our true selves, 
constantly avoiding or protesting against the emotional situations of day-to-day -day life that we still find scary. And at some point, many people develop physical issues which stem from the long-term effect of that emotional avoidance and repression. So, how do we develop the courage, the commitment to recognize that we need to move from a subconscious state of fear to the conscious state of open-heartedness? Well, first of all, it takes practice. And practice requires both a supportive and educational environment. For example, a church community opening up like a flower to the essence of spirituality. From my perspective, Westside UU is on the threshold of a life-affirming, even breathtaking transformation of what it means to become alive to the nature of spirituality. You could even call it a state of consciousness associated with the teachings of Jesus as being fully human and fully divine. I believe that our church is full of people who are feeling that tug towards experiencing depth and authenticity with each other. And yet, many of us still react from the old fight or flight patterns of childhood and adolescence whenever we're faced with the problematic emotional situations which do come up sooner or later in our encounters with each other. So one of the things I recommend is learning about conflict transformation because this can assist us in developing emotional courage and commitment to authenticity between ourselves within this supportive educational environment of our spiritual community. Dr. Brene Brown of the University of Houston writes in her book, Braving the Wilderness, that people often silence themselves or agree to disagree without fully exploring the actual nature of the disagreement for the sake of protecting a relationship or maintaining a comfortable connection. But when we avoid certain conversations and never fully learn how the other person feels about the issues involved, we sometimes end up making assumptions that not only perpetuate, but deepen misunderstandings. And that can generate resentment. These results of misunderstanding and resentment are often worse for the relationship than just having the so-called argument would be. The key here is to learn how to navigate conflicts or differences of opinion in a way that deepens mutual understanding, even if two people still disagree. Imagine that after a meaningful conversation, two people could actually have increased their mutual understanding, greater mutual respect, and better connection, but still disagree. Now, this outcome is very different from avoiding a conversation and not learning more about ourselves and the other person. Dr. Brown also points out, we are wired for connection. 
But the key is that in any given moment, it has to be real. Now, part of what is required for being real is a willingness to address the underlying intentions present within a conversation. She explains that intention is the deepest level reason of why the topic is so important to a person. We have to understand what truly matters to us and learn why this topic is so important to the other person as well. For example, two family members may strongly disagree about the planning of a family event. One or both of them may have an underlying intention of wanting to create more opportunities for the family to stay connected. But that may sound very different than the details of what the disagreement appears to be. Speaking our intention does not mean that we will suddenly have the same preferences or opinions but it often helps us to navigate difficult conversations and maintain and build connections through actually understanding each other's motives and interests. And to do this, we have to be willing to endure some discomfort and discover that it won't psychologically kill us to do so. We have to find the courage to feel the fear and do it anyway. Dr. Brown goes on to state that one of the most essential steps in this transformative kind of communication, and perhaps the most courageous, is not only to be open-minded, but to listen with desire to learn more about the other person's perspective. This means that one of the most courageous things to say in an uncomfortable conversation is, tell me more. Exactly when we want to turn away and change the topic or just end the conversation? We have the prime opportunity to ask ourselves, what else do I need to know to fully understand the other person's perspective? For example, by saying, help me understand why this is so important to you. Or, Help me understand why you don't agree with this idea. And then we both have to listen, really listen. Because listening to understand is not about agreeing or disagreeing. We have to listen to understand in the same way that we want to be understood. Finally, Dr. Brown advocates communicating on the level, which means having the courage and commitment to avoid indulging in behaviors like gossip and triangulation, which are based on fear, and instead engaging with the person involved by speaking directly to them about whatever our concerns or issues may be. Communicating on the level isn't about fitting in or pretending or making the people around us more comfortable because that's emotionally safer. It requires us to be vulnerable, to risk getting uncomfortable and learning how to be authentic with people, which can be done without sacrificing who we are 
and what we value. Now granted, there are skills for communicating on the level that some of us need to learn in order to speak calmly and kindly and successfully navigate our way through disagreement or misunderstanding. And that's a good topic for another time. But when the outcome is an ability to achieve healthy, uplifting, enlightening resolution, then the practice of exchanging fear for open-heartedness is a commitment well worth making to ourselves and to the people in our lives. We can do so by beginning to utilize the keys described in Braving the Wilderness. One, learning how to navigate conflicts or differences of opinion in ways that deepen mutual understanding. Two, being real by addressing the underlying intentions of a conversation. And three, listening to understand in the same way that we want to be understood. Thank you.